So good evening, everyone. Um, well, I do not have any video in this in this uh, particular talk. The reason is very obvious because my topic is prevention of slow flow and not treatment. So I can never prove that what I have done has actually prevented slow flow. So it's going to be more of a didactic talk. And this is something you come across. Uh, it's not something which makes you feel happy when you are doing the plasty yourself. That's a slow flow or, knee, or no reflow. So this is a no reflow is characterized by angiographic evidence of slow or no anti-grade uh, epigardial flow resulting in inadequate myocardial perfusion in the absence of any evidence of mechanical vessel obstruction. And this may occur in the setting of acute coronary syndrome as in primary PCI or in a stable patient who is undergoing an interventional procedure, maybe PCI, complex PCI, maybe rota, and it's due to a functional and structural alteration of the microcirculation, the coronary microcirculation. However, in some, uh, uh, in a proportion of cases, it may regress spontaneously. And if you ask me about the incidence, it's about five to sixty percent has been described. A huge, uh, vast range. And the reason is like depending on the patient population that's been studied. I mean, if you only study patients who had an atherectomy done, maybe high, as opposed to like maybe in a stable patient. Uh, where you have just use a uh, balloon, perhaps. So incidence is higher in primary PCI for STEMI and a saphenous venous graft PCI and rotational atherectomy in highly calcified lesions. Now, it's very interesting to look at the pathophysiologic mechanisms. Broadly, there are three. That's ischemic reperfusion injury. It could be microvascular obstruction resulting from distal atherothrombotic embolization or even from intravascular plugging, which may happen from leukocytes of platelet uh, microthrombi. And thirdly, it could be microvascular spasm. Most of the time, it's not a single phenomena, it's all, this, uh, all these three together. And which mechanism will be predominant, that depends on the setting in which it has occurred. Now, I've just made an attempt to elaborate like how, what happens actually in uh, slow flow. Now, initially, of course, there is a ischemic injury and this initial severe ischemia causes damage, not only to the cardiomyocyte, but also to the endothelium. And endothelial damage from ischemia results in endothelial necrosis, cell necrosis, resulting in destruction of tight junctions and loss of vascular integrity. So there is extravascular edema, and this results to vascular compression and a reduction in the microvascular lumen. Also at the same time, ischemia causes endothelial dysfunction. So release of nitric oxide is reduced and this impairs the endothelium dependent vasodilatation. Now ischemia to cardiomyocytes results in cell necrosis and, myocardio and cardiomyocyte swelling. This again may compress the intramural vessels. Now ischemia is followed by reperfusion and this reperfusion injury is, you know, it actually worsens what has been already been done by the ischemic injury. So reperfusion is associated with production of oxygen-free radicals, which further cause endothelial disruption as well as inflammation. It causes migration of neutrophil and platelets forming microthrombi, which obstructs the lumen of the microvasculature. Also, reperfusion is associated with autonomic dysfunction, and there is intense alpha adrenergic receptor mediated constriction of the coronary vessels, which results in microvascular spasm. And the third is, of course, the distal atherothrombotic embolization, which happens more in a stable PCI setting. So where I know we do a PCI of a complex plaque and there's distal embolization of the microthrombi and plaque components, which causes occlusion of microvasculature resulting in microinfarcts, which again promotes release of uh, pro-inflammatory and vasoactive substances. And this further causes damage and, microvascul and, and vascular spasm. Now, no flow, reflow is not good for you. It's bad. It increases your, the, it worsens the outcomes. So the mechanism perhaps is if blood flow cannot enter or leave an area of necrotic my myocardium, then the cells such as macrophages, which are actually necessary for removal of debris, they cannot function. 
and the humoral factors necessary for proper healing cannot access the tissue. So it would result in poor healing of the infarct. So in short term, that can cause increase in acute heart failure, incidence of acute heart failure, malignant arrhythmias, cardiogenic shock, and death. Also in the long term, it would result in adverse left ventricular remodeling, resulting in congestive heart failure, rehospitalization, and MACE, including death. Now, the diagnosis is usually done from coronary angiography. At times, when there is slow flow instead of no reflow, you can take note of the Timmy flow, the frame count, or the myocardial brush, a blush. If, say, you have thrombolized the patient and you find the patient's having, uh, you know, the ECG, there's no ECG resolution or resolution less than 50% within, say, after 60 to 90 minutes, then you can say, well, it's indicative of no reflow. And also there are other ways to do like MRI, the contra, gadolinium contrast enhanced cardiac MRI, contrast echo or nuclear imaging. Now it's important to know the predictors of no reflow because if you want to prevent no reflow, then you need to know the predictors and you know how you can improve them. Now there are the predictors of no reflow can be divided into two groups. There could be patient specific features or procedure related features. Patient specific features are age over 65, female, hypertension, smoking, dyslipidemia, diabetes, renal failure, uh, rheumatoid arthritis or other inflammatory process, atrial fibrillation, all this would increase the risk. On the other hand, procedure related factors we know, increase in thrombotic load, delayed presentation, high pressure inflations, use of debulking devices, that would increase the chances of no reflow. Now, coming to the prevention of no reflow, I will divide it into three categories generally accepted, controversial, and experimental. Now, what are these generally accepted? Now, we know that shortened door to balloon time would reduce the incidence of, near, uh, of no reflow. And that is, that is because more prolonged ischemia is associated with more microcirculatory damage and therefore development of no reflow phenomena. And also we know like direct stenting in acute MI would cause less embolization of the debris and that would also result in reduced no reflow. And if you avoid high pressure post dilatation uh, with balloon in patients who are at high risk of no reflow, then it's very obvious like there would be less uh, you know, embolization and less reflow, uh, chances of reflow. And if you're using uh, rota, say, then you always try to use shorter bar runs and lower speeds and avoid decelerations. Uh, you know, if, if you really, you know, especially in high risk space in patients who are at high risk of uh, no reflow. And in case of cephalous venous grafting PCI, again, which is associated with high incidence of no reflow, is best to use an embolic protection device. And uh, there's been some evidence to say that pretreatment with intracoronary vasodilators could be useful in such a situation. Now, also we know like there's some other things, factors like if you have cardiovascular risk factors and if these are very optimally controlled when the patient is going to have a PCI, then it reduces chances of no reflow. And statin pretreatment has some evidence, and it showed that although, although it uh, did improve the coronary flow of the primary PCI, it actually didn't reduce the maze. Now, there's some controversial issues. For example, what about intracoronary vasodilators to prevent slow flow, not in treatment? Now, the Amistad 1 and 2 has showed that the clinical outcomes uh, in, in patients undergoing primary PCI uh, were not significantly improved with adenosine although the infarct size is reduced. And reflow stemi showed that neither the infarct size nor the microvascular obstruction uh, uh, was reduced by um, intravenous nitroprusside or adenosine. Sorry, in, uh, not intravenous, I would say intracoronary. Now, it's a very interesting topic is that of glycoprotein uh, 2B3 uh, A inhibitors. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, the on time two study, which was done quite some time ago, is a study which showed that the pre hospital initiation of bolus tyrofibin could result in ST segment resolution and improvement in clinical outcome after primary PCI. But note that such trials were done before actually the potent uh, PY, uh, P2, Y2 inhibitors like Tacagal and Prasugal was available. But the contemporary trials have not demonstrated such a useful effect. However, patients undergoing primary PCI may benefit from it, especially if there's an established no reflow, large thrombus burden, or for bailout um, uh, cases. 
Now, regarding thrombus aspiration, a meta-analysis has shown, has failed to show the long-term benefit. On the other hand, manipulating the occluded area with balloons and stents often results in distal embolization of the thrombus, which may contribute to development of no reflow. So routine aspiration should be avoided and should be limited to the presence of uh, angiography visible thrombus only. And lastly, the experimental ones, and these are the ones like intracoronary fibrinolysis, ischemic uh, preconditioning or conditioning, therapeutic hypothermia, and hyperoxemic reperfusion. I wouldn't discuss these because these are, have not been shown really to help. Thank you very much.